Welcome to the Growing People Podcast. I'm John Losey. Today, we're going to talk with Michelle Cummings. She is an author. She's a speaker and facilitator. She's an entrepreneur and a risk taker. And we're going to talk about her history in the profession of team building and facilitation. We're going to talk about some of the risks she's taken to start up a couple of businesses and a little bit about her new new business venture. I guess it's, it's four or five years old now, uh, Personify Leadership, along with her uh, her bread and butter, which is training wheels, and her new book called The Real Sisters, her first venture into fiction. Before we do, like any good podcaster, I need to ask you to subscribe. I'm learning how to do this. I'm getting better every day, and I need your help by subscribing. YouTube only makes available certain tools if you have a certain minimum number of subscribers. So you can help me by subscribing to this channel so that I can continue to learn and get better. So Michelle has a bachelor's degree in psychology and her master's degree in experiential education. She started uh, Training Wheels, her business she's the founder of back in, I believe, 1999. She'll get, uh, get more into that. She's written several books uh, in the field of experiential learning, team building, and uh, she just came out this year with her first venture into fiction called The Real Sisters. So, Michelle, welcome. So glad you're here. Thanks, John. I'm excited to be here. So this is going to be fun. We go a ways back. We do, indeed. So in the introduction, I went into a little bit of detail about your your background, what you studied, and some of the business you started. But I want to hear from you. How do you describe what it is that you do? Yeah, so at Training Wheels, we're a creative resource for building teams. So I started Training Wheels back in 1999, back when I couldn't find a job, and so I made one up. So I thought, you know, I'm pretty good at making up games for a living. Maybe I'll make up a job and maybe it'll work for me. So, and here I am uh, 19-ish years later and uh, and it's still working for me. So, so how I got into experiential education was I got my bachelor's degree in psychology and I, my, my first job out of college was working for a wilderness program that worked with troubled teens. And, and the average length of stay for these kids was six to nine months. And while we were there at that, um, you know, that organization, that I really fell in love with the amazing transformations that I saw in these kids after I would put them through some experiential activities. And, and I, I fell in love with the amazing transformations I saw from with, you know, when they came into the program and then doing these activities and then um, really seeing big changes to them before they went home. So, so after that experience, I wanted to learn more about why the experiential piece of what we did worked so well. So that's when I went and got my master's degree in experiential education. And, and, and from there, um, you, you kind of worked in the ropes course world for several years before I started tra uh, training wheels in 1999. So I know you're not from Colorado, but you're you ended up in in the Denver area. Tell me, I, I hear it was working for a resort that got you uh, into right. the Colorado area. Tell me how that happened. Yeah. So at the time, I, I had contracted with a ropes course builder, and what they were doing. This was back in the '90s when the ropes course industry was really pretty well, was thriving, and lo lots of organizations were putting in different uh, ropes course programs, but a lot of them, they would put in up the ropes course, but they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know how to market it. They didn't know how to staff it. They didn't know how to do run programs. So I had contracted with this ropes course builder that, um, that anytime they put up a new facility, I would go out and I would contract with a new facility for anywhere from three months to a year. And I would help them build their ropes course, hire and train their staff, write their staff manual, start marketing the program and walk them through that first three months to, to a year of clients. And uh, so, and I did that for several years. And then the last place I did that was here in Colorado. So resort, it's, it's unfortunately no longer in business. They, um, they ended the, the, it's now a rafting company. And so they, the ropes course was moved and, and things like that. But, but the, um, but the day I moved to Colorado was the day I met my husband. And so at that point, I couldn't just pick up and move to where the next ropes course program was after we had started dating and we got engaged. And so that's when that's how training wheels got started. Actually, I thought, well, if I can't build a course where people can come to me and go out to all the people and can go literally around the globe. So, Michelle, I want you to tell me a story. 
Tell me about the first time you ever facilitated or led an activity. Oh, gosh. Um, let's see here. The, probably the first team building game and stuff that I remember was probably at that wilderness camp. And so how the camp was structured was um, I worked with a 12 and 13 year old girl group and and we lived outside in tents year round. It was it was a pretty amazing program. And a part of the part of the we decide what they're doing. And so, you know, we actually had a school on, on property as well, but, but part of that, uh, of each day was to do something, um, you know, as a group, whether it be a work project or a team building activity of some sort. And, and so, so that's where I first got exposed to, you know, things like group juggle and, you know, like, like how do you get the girls to do that? And so the staff there were, were so great that we, they, we had a plethora, a, a huge library full of books by Carl Ronke and, you know, the new games books and, and, and things that were my initial introduction into the experiential games. And, and I fell in love with it. I, I have always been one that has um, made up my own games. When I was a kid on the farm in Kansas, I would always make up a new game of some sort when we were out, you know, fixing fence or, you know, milking cows or, you know, whatever it was we were doing there. I always made up some sort of game to make whatever job I was doing more fun. And really that's still who I am to my core is that I still play games for a living. And I love to find those little lessons and uh, make it experiential for the people that are participating in my programs now. What do you think when you started thinking about facilitation and experiential education, what makes it different than just playing games? You know, really, the just playing games part, I always choose the activities that I'm going to do with a group intentionally. So there's some sort of behavior or or something that happens in the game that I want to intentionally surface to then um, kind of program my debrief around um, that particular behavior. So, so as a team building facilitator in organization, we get calls all the time from people that says, Hey, I want to work with, you know, we, we want to do a program, you know, for a group of our executives or, or our team or whatever it is. And we want to work on trust. We want to work on communication. We want to work on, you know, kind of all the big buzzwords that we all know and, and hear a lot in the team building industry. And, and so when I hear those buzzwords, you know, different activities start to pop in my mind and then when I do a needs assessment with them I was like well tell me more about that like when you you know if we if you choose to hire us and we do a program with you you know and you say you want to work on communication what does that look like if, if we've delivered a successful program for you what does that look like back in the real world what are your people doing differently if if I'm able to successfully tackle that in the program that we're going to do together so so really then after I get you know, really what their end product, what success looks like for them. Then I back up and I start to program in the activities that are going to surface the behaviors that are going to get me to let them talk about it, to make some action plans and goals to get to that successful behavior back in the real world. Okay. So let's, let's dive into your uh, perspectives around facilitation. Okay. What do you think are the two or three key skills or competencies that make for a great facilitator? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, the first thing that kind of point is confidence. You've got to be confident at the front of the room, whether it be in front of a boardroom, whether it be just in front of the group, um, you've got to carry yourself in a way that you know, that you know what you're doing. Um, and I also think sense of humor is a, is a big attribute of a successful facilitator. Um, so that way you, you know, when, you know, what to say, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, uh, but also just to make it light and fun, because I really do believe that people um, are their truest selves when they're playing games and having fun. And then at the same time, that's when those natural behaviors will pop up, that then you can um, create those real world lessons or those teachable moments for them when you have just caught them in their own behaviors. And so I think a sense of humor, um, I think goes hand in hand with, uh, with confidence. Um, and then experience, you know, just, you know, getting those uh, years under your belt of co either co-facilitating with others, um, shadowing people, and then just having the experience of, of being that facilitator and, and having those curveballs thrown at you and then being creative in the moment to figure out how to tackle them. Um, you can't, you can't, I mean, you can fake it so much, but man, um, just those years of experience will really help um, 
tackle them even more the you know the more that you do it so if what do you think is the biggest misconceptions about facilitation or facilitators how do people get this wrong how do people get it wrong um sometimes i think arrogance maybe might be be a part of it to where if it, or if you're not relatable if you are the know-it-all at the front of the room um or the know-it-all in front of the group then um then i think that's where a lot of times participants will get turned off by facilitators so um i am one of the one thing that i make sure that i do often when i facilitate is admit my mistakes and so if if i am trying to surface a behavior in the group um, that they've identified they want to work on i make sure that i bring in multiple examples of when i did this poorly um, and not to make it look like i don't know what i'm doing but you do it in a way to where um, you're relatable and and as soon as you're a relatable person and a relatable relatable facilitator to them then you know your relationship with them change and they now see you kind of on an equal playing field you're still facilitating the process but yet you're still um, a learner along the way as well and and you know I think as soon as people can admit their own mistakes and their own flaws it it helps tremendously so I don't know if you've ever got this question but people have asked me we're in similar businesses and they ask what do i do if i want a career in facilitation team building the, this uh, this profession yeah so um i get this question often actually and so um and my response is um volunteer as much as you can if, especially if it's not your job yet and you want it to be but yet you can't give up your full-time gig until you can decide if you want to do this gig I always tell people volunteer um, in in many places. If you just you know Google you know team building companies in your area, you're going to find them and just get involved with them and um, take them out to coffee and find out what they're looking for in a facilitator. What are their requirements? Um, is there special training that you need to do? Um, and then learn as much as you can about it. You know, participate in podcasts like this and learn from people that have been doing it for a long time read all of the books and uh, but then also go to conferences conferences that are specific to this industry are ripe for job opportunities as well as the learning that you can do there can grow your facilitation skills immensely in a very shortened you know two to three day experience and uh, and really can make you the connections that you need also to really help propel you in the, in your career okay what um so you you do a lot of conferences. I do. Yeah. If you were new to the industry, what should you be looking for at a conference? Because they can. There's a lot of them, and they can get rather expensive. So you got to be selective. Yeah. So if if budget is a concern, most of the conferences that are more of our of the team building industry specific, a lot of them have um, a service crew that you can go and you can volunteer to be on. And most of the time, if you're on a service crew, then your registration is comped. And then you can actually self-select which workshops you want to um, go and be the crew person for, which basically just means you help set up the room and things like that. But then you get to stay and participate and hear the speaker. And, and so there's some affordable ways to do that. Um, and you know, I would say if you're team building specific, there's probably three, three or so conferences that I would recommend. Um, do you want me to talk about those, sure, John? Do you yeah. want me to so, um, so the three conferences that I would recommend, um, the first one would be um, NCCPS, the Facilitators Conference, which um, NCCPS used to stand for the National Challenge Course Practitioner Symposium. And uh, so now it's, and it's always gone by the acronym of NCCPS. And so now uh, Tom and Jen Leahy out of Boulder, Colorado, Colorado and Leahy and Associates put on this conference every year. Look at that, John's got it popped up on the screen there. And it is, um, it is a wonderful conference. In fact, this was the very first conference that I ever presented to my peers at, um, gosh, 19, 20 years ago. And, and now it's, you know, part of, you know, now I get paid uh, to go and present at conferences all around the globe. So this is such a wonderful conference. It's an amazing learning experience. And, uh, it, and it's done very differently than what most traditional conferences are to where it, they use this concept called open space to where there's no actually workshop set when you show up on day one, but everybody brings workshops to do. And then you set the schedule once you're there. So it's really a phase from a year and I've gone 
um, almost every year for the last 19 years to this conference. So, and then um, the other two that I would recommend would be AEE, the Association for Experiential Education, their international conference. And that is usually every October or November every year. And they move that one all around um, the country. And, some, and this last year it was even in Canada. Um, and then also the Association for Challenge Course Technology or ACCT. And that conference is usually every February-ish timeframe um, each year. Yeah, that so, one just happened, right? It did. It just happened last week or the week before. And I was at both of those this year, both AEE, ACCT, and then NCCPS is actually coming up in a couple weeks. So, um, so those three conferences there um, really do cater to the team building facilitator. And then there's other conferences like the American Camping Association and a few others like that that still have a team building thread, but also have lots of other things that for that specific one related to camping. And so it kind of depends on the direction in which you would like to take your facilitation. If you want to do more of the corporate facilitation and team building, then I would recommend possibly going to the ATD conference, the Association for Talent Development. And that one has over 10,000 HR professionals that come to it and they have an experiential track that go along with that conference as well. So, um, yeah, ATD yeah. has uh, local chapters all over the place and all kinds of opportunities to get to know the HR people. As a matter of fact, a lot of the people I talk to who they are in the team building world already are asking, how do I get in the corporate piece? Yeah. Uh, that's a tough transition to make. What advice would you give for people transitioning or wanting to get into corporate team building and leadership? Yeah, so um, so one thing I always uh, recommend to people is, is if you have, can find an organization that really does promote the experiential piece internally within the, their organization, then, you know, um, a lot of times you, if you go to those local chapter meetings for ATD or, or ODN, the um, Organizational Development Network, um, those will, um, a lot of times they'll have networking events and you can really get to know kind of the people that work for each one of those organizations at those networking events first. And then you can ask questions. And a lot of times those are like $15, you know, once a month, something like that. And it's literally just a meet and greet and, and uh, you can find, find them that way. Another way is to contact local chambers of commerce um, as well and, uh, and find out what organizations are in your local area and, and then contact them to see if they have an experiential piece as well. Um, another thing I recommend is finding an experiential program that you can become certified in um, and then become certified in it. And then that is a resume builder that then if there's an organizational looking for a, a team building facilitator and you've already got the certification in place, then that will help market you and, and kind of set you apart from some of the other applicants as well. That's that's a great idea of just looking for some of those certifications or pre-existing programs that you could become a facilitator in and bring your special flavor to it. Absolutely. Hey, I want to kind of change gears a little bit. And you have both you and your husband have been successful in entrepreneurial pursuits. You've you started training wheels. He started his consulting company. You you both have taken risks out there. And I want, can you tell some stories about risks you've taken uh, that have paid off and maybe something that didn't really pay off? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, you know, I didn't know I was an entrepreneur until, you know, until I kind of got backed into a corner after, you know, my last facilitation job that I had when working for somebody else. Then when I met Paul and then, you know, and then all of a sudden I looked around the Denver area and the greater state of Colorado for a full-time facilitator position. And I just couldn't find anyone that hired full-time staff. They only hired contract staff. And so in my mind, I didn't want to try to piece together a paycheck and work for five different people and, and try to make that work every month. So that, that's when I started training wheels. And I, I had no, I, I do not have a business background. I had never taken a business class ever in any of my schooling or anything like that. So, and it really surprised me at how easy it was. Like you literally just go down to, you know, to this one of the state offices and you fill out a form and then boom, you're a business owner. Like I was like, okay, that was crazy how easy, you know, quote unquote easy it was to actually put it into paper. But then, you know, but then of course the hard work begins. And when I started training wheels, this is when the internet was still kind of new. 
And so, so I thought, well, maybe I'll get a website and, you know, maybe that will pan out for me. And, and so, and actually, and of course the internet now is one of the main reasons why I am as successful as I am is because I put out a newsletter, you know, once a week to, and it goes out to over 15,000 people in 65 countries. And, and I would not be able to do that once a week if I was, if we were still sending out snail mail newsletters to, to everybody. So, um, but as far as things that went well and things that didn't go well or things that we didn't necessarily anticipate happening, um, for sure, the, um, the, the economy crash in 2009 and 10, like nobody saw that coming. And that, you know, being a self-employed person, both Paul and I are both self-employed. So to um, so one piece of advice I always give to people is to get a business line of credit before you need it. Because as soon as you need it, banks aren't going to give it to you. <laughs> and so for those new people starting out, that's and they're they're difficult to secure, if, especially if you don't have you know several years of of business behind you yet. But yet, as soon as you do, um, that's one thing I always recommend is is have a funding source somewhere, um, whether it be through a bank line of credit or something, before you need it. Because um, like when the economy crashed, we had a savings account at the time and. We blew through that pretty, pretty quickly and uh, it got really scary there for um, several months about, you know, we were like, okay, I think we might have to go get other jobs for a while because who knew how long that was going to last, right? So, so, so that was one thing that I didn't anticipate. And then with Training Wheels being a, an inventory based business, you know, I started Training Wheels with um, three products and training and now we have over 350 products and books and and multiple trainings and online games database and you know we have multiple facets that make up training wheels and and so with an inventory based business you always have the cash flow crisis of like okay we ran out of debriefing thumb balls and guess what now we have to go and um, I need to you know drop a large chunk of cash to get the next round in and so it's it's always that ebb and flow of of cash flow in a in an uh, when you're a, a small business owner that can sometimes surprise you. Yeah, so. when when all your money is in rubber chickens and you're out of uh, debriefing thumbballs, that's an issue. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Some of the conversations we have here at the office are very funny because, like, the body part debrief is one of the activities that um, I've had. That was actually one of the very first activities I ever had. And, so as soon as we run out of brains, then we have to, you know, buy more brains. And so, so like, does anyone, are we out of hearts? Is it, do we have any hands? You know, like, anybody got a heart? We're looking for a heart. a heart. I, I cannot find my brains right now. Where are they? So, yeah. So yeah, some I, of the conversations. I think this industry lends itself to some weird conversations when it comes to props. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so I, I recently, or actually it's not recently, it's been a few years now, uh, you expanded out in, is are the co-founder and chief creative officer for Personify Leadership. How did that come about? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so how Personify came to be was uh, I have um, a, a, my business owner or my business partner, Angela Siebeli with Personify Leadership. She was a client of mine at Training Wheels at one point in time. And, um, but before, when, how she found me was actually a very kind of funny story. She was working for an organization and their parent company was over in the Switzerland area. So they flew her to Switzerland for a conference. And while she was there, somebody there was doing some experiential activities. And so she asked, is that, does anybody know of anybody that does this over in the States? And, she, and someone there said, yeah, you need to look up Michelle Cummings at Training Wheels because she does this back in the States. So she flies home and looks me up, gives me a call. And lo and behold, um, I was about six miles away from her. She lived in, uh, she was in the Golden, Colorado area, and I was, I'm here in, in Littleton, Colorado area. So she had to fly all the way to Switzerland to find me. But she brought me in, and she had designed a leadership development course internally at her organization. She was one of the HR directors there. And um, and so, but it was it was pretty sit and get, and she wanted to bring in some experiential activities that would really kind of bring some of the content to life. So, so I took a look at her curriculum and plugged in some activities here and there. And, and it really did uh, bring that, the whole program to life and people loved it. And, and so, so after that experience, we started working together and, um, you know, for her between a couple of moves, we kind of still worked together all along the way. And then several years later, she, you know, she had, she brought me in to do a project and we just got to um, talking one night over dinner about, like, you know what, this is a really good partnership, bringing in her skills of the corporate leadership development and, and then my skills with the experiential piece. 
and marrying those two skills together. And, and it really did, and that's what Personify is today. So we started Personify uh, back in 2013. And so it's a two-day leadership development course, our core program, our first program that we created. And it focuses on eight core competencies of effective leadership. Because most of the time in organizations, people are hired up because they're good at their job and not necessarily because they have great leadership skills. So, so what we do is we took, we basically just whittled down you know, to what we thought were the eight most critical leadership development skills that you need to have to be an effective leader. And then we created um, these little modules around each one of those. And so through each one of those, we surface behaviors naturally through an experiential activity to kick off the module. And then, so we have that experience and then we go into the classroom and we ground those, that experience behaviors that we need to learn skills around how to manage those behaviors back in the workplace. We ground them with research and, uh, and we teach practical hands-on uh, skills that they can immediately transfer back to the workplace the very next day after they get back, um, back to work. That sounds uh, pretty exciting. Very, very, I had a very similar experience with, uh, adding an experiential component to corporate leadership development. It's amazing. I love your phrase that you use. I think you use this, the sit and get, it was to sit and get. Yes. And, uh, uh -huh. I, being inside a corporate world, it's so difficult to convince people to do something different. They know it doesn't work. And yet there's right. that fear piece of we can't do anything different because that's too much of a risk. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what the experientials do. So it's not a full day of experientials. It's really just a couple here and there that are going to, again, serve as those behaviors that people encounter every single day in the workplace. We all work with that guy. We all have to manage that behavior, you know, like whatever those things are. Or maybe even it's the self-discovery piece of like, oh, my gosh, I do that. And now all of a sudden I've had this big aha moment. Now, what do I do with it? All right. Well, here's here's three skills on how to manage that behavior, either for yourself or for somebody, you know, for one of your direct reports back in the real world. I see many people who are coming from the team building world, the experiential world, and trying to get into corporate, what they try and do is piece together a traditional team building program where it's all experiential, debrief, and then move on to the next activity. And right. what I find is that that's lacking some of the content theory research that needs to be there as well. And also, waiting until the end to talk about practical pieces, people miss out on that. I, I, I think what you guys are doing and mixing in saying, here's this piece, let's surface the behaviors, let's help you experience what these competencies are, and now let's talk about how do you develop them. Right, exactly. And so, yeah, which you, that, that's exactly, you just described Personify, basically. So, so, you know, with each one of those eight behaviors, you know, and we always tell leaders as they go through the program too, as you go through them, there's going to be some of them that you're like, you know what, I actually do this really well. You know, and so of those eight, you're just going to basically, you know, just strengthen something that maybe that's already um, a strong suit for you, but you're going to find your development areas. I mean, I, I teach the course. I help co-create the, the course itself. And every time I teach it or every time I, I have leaders go through it, it, I'm still learning stuff about myself because you ebb and flow as a leader. You're not just because I'm good at it today doesn't mean that if I don't con continue to exercise that muscle that I'm going to be good at it five years from now. I've got to stay fresh. I've got to keep working at that or, you know, it'll become, you know, a little stale or my skills will be a little rusty. So. So uh, after having led so many of these workshops, what two questions. One, what do you think is the most common competency that people are really good at? What, what do people have down? And then the opposite side, what's the most common competencies most leaders need development in? That is a really good question. Um, I can answer the second part first, or I can answer the second part really easily. But uh, as far as the first part, if I think about it for just a second, um, really, I, I think of the eight competencies that we teach. We teach, you know, in the heart of a leader, we teach, we, we teach and talk about how to be a leader who looks out for the best intention of others. And, and if I think about, you know, at the end of our program, we we'll always have the, the leader self-identify which one of the eight competencies do they most want to work on back in the real world? And if I have to think, and then we actually have different um, stress relievers that kind of match the competencies that they get to take one of those home with them. So that way then, and we tell them to put it somewhere they're going to see it every day to help remind them to work on it. So if I think about the competency that maybe isn't as chosen as much 
as the others. I would almost, I think I would want to say it's the heart of a leader. Someone that I think, a, I think most of the time, you know, in that, in that particular competency, we talk about how to be a leader whose intention is to look out for the best interest of others. So, and I think most of us, when we show up to work every day, we're not there to, you know, kind of um, make life difficult for people. I think we're, we're, we're generally there looking out for our teams and for the organization. Because if you're a leader that looks out for number one all the time, people are going to know that and they're not really going to want to work for you. Um, and so that's probably one that people um, maybe don't select as one that they need to work on as much as some of the other ones. The other ones um, that people need to work on a little bit better is, I would say there's two, maybe a tie for two. One is um, being an effective communicator and how to make sure that I'm uh, being a good listener and also um, communicating a message that will resonate with my team. And then also the spine of a leader, how to be a leader, leader who's courageous in tough times and how to have those courageous conversations when you need to have them and not sweep them under the rug and, um, and just hope that they go away because that's usually where conflict starts and, uh, and you end up with a much larger pro uh, problem at, in the end than if you would have just addressed it at the very beginning. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the spine the, piece, the which spine. is... You know, Lencioni talks about how conflict is essential for effective teams and groups, but if you don't have the spine to approach the hard conversations, then they're just it's going to be negative conflict and it's going to be avoidance. Absolutely. And Angela Siebeli, my business partner with Personify, she's, this is a, such a strength of her. She actually just wrote a book this last year called The Courageous Leader. And it's a wonderful collection of stories of leaders that um, when they chose to step up and, and, uh, and, and exercise that courage muscle and, um, and even, and then also she tells great stories about herself as well. So um, highly recommend that. And we actually just created a one day uh, program around the courageous leader as well. So we have our core program, the personified leadership core program. And then we also now have this new program called the courageous leader uh, workshop that will really in a, in a one day time frame really help you exercise that courage muscle and, um, and, and gain some new skills around how to address those, those courageous conversations when you need to have them. Very cool. So a um, couple of last questions here, just to wrap it up. Uh, what books besides your own do you most often give to other people? Oh, that's a great question. Well, it, uh, so give me context. What kind of book? Is it more like a team building book or just um, any book? What books do you most, you can take it any way you want, but okay. think about the last time you've given books to people. Which ones yeah. have you given, even if it's a coloring book? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great point. Um, so, well, one book that I routinely purchase and give away is um, Dr. Seuss's um, Oh, The Places You'll Go. I love that book um, very, very much. So anytime anyone has a milestone of any kind, whether it be a graduation or a marriage or, or anything like that, that is a common book that I purchase and, and give away to people. Um, Another, I'm, I'm also, I love the DISC assessment profile. So another book that I love um, and give away is The Eight Dimensions of Teams, where and they talk about um, the DISC profile in that one. That's a good one that I give away often. Um, and then Angela's new book, The Courageous Leader, I give that one away uh, left and right because it really is so good, and she did such a great job with that. And, um, and then from a team-building book point of view, um, I love um, anything by Chris Cabert um, or Sam Sykes. And uh, they're probably two of my favorites. And then my tried and true Carl Ronke books. Um, he also was, you know, a mentor of mine. The very first books I ever read in the industry were um, were Carl Ronke books. And so I still give away. In fact, this last year at AEE, I have this growing collection of Carl Ronke books because he's written like 27 books, and they have all of them. But I, I there were some of them I had like five copies of of all of them because they're so rare and hard to find. Anytime I find them on eBay or anything like that for like a dollar or two, I'd pick them up. And and so um, so anyway, I, I donated them this last year to, at the AEE conference, all my extras, because I was the I was actually awarded the Carl Rocky Creativity Award at the conference this year. And so I thought, what an appropriate way to donate all those books to AEE. And then they put them in their fundraiser uh, or their silent auction, and which created um, scholarships for people to actually, that was kind of a that was a fun thing for me as a as a give back to the industry. So. That's great. I love the the go to the children's books. Uh, oh, the places you go is probably the equivalent of 
you know, Angela Duckworth's uh, grit and uh, uh, Carol Dwick's mindset is basically saying, look, you're going places. Uh, mm -hmm. In the wisdom of Dr. Seuss, uh, he foretold of the wisdom of Dr. Dwick and Dr. Duckworth. Yes, absolutely. I also love another fun kid book I love is Click Clack Moo. <laughs> if you ever read that, Click Clack Moo, Duck for President. Oh my gosh, he that is they're hysterical. They make me laugh. So I also love those. Those are important. Yeah. Last question. I just want just some practical stuff. Do you have any go-to apps or technology? How do you help keep yourself organized or how do you leverage technology? Uh Oh gosh, my husband is laughing right now because I am I I can do technology, but I am not gifted in the technology world. I always tell people um, I have other gifts, right? Because it's not one that I'm gifted at. Um, but if I were to pick up my phone and the uh, you know the apps that I go to, like I have all my track, like. I have to keep them all in like their own little folder. So I know exactly where all my travel apps are. And I know where all these are. My, uh, my husband would love it if I were um, a little bit better at Google Calendar and a few things like that. I, I, I struggle in some of those areas. But, um, but I, I definitely love to stay connected with people. So I'm, I, I love the social media channels and things like that. And um, so those help me stay connected. They don't help me stay organized, but they help me stay connected. Well, and I, I, to me, like your husband and I geek out over technology all the time. So we're the wrong yeah. people to ask about apps and things. Your yeah. insight, what do you actually use? Because more people are in your world than in mine. So. Yeah. So um, I definitely use like GoToMeeting and for, you know, to schedule webinars and some of our, my business type calls. I, I use those types of apps. Um, you know, those are service based. So there's a monthly service fee on those. But those are those are critical in helping me stay organized with, you know, doing webinars and calls with with clients, especially global clients. Now that Personify is in 20 different countries all across the globe. Um, using a platform that's internationally uh, friendly is also really important. So, so and Citrix, who has been the uh, creator of that program, has been a, a, a great client of ours for a long time as well. So it's it's fun for us to give back to our clients as well by utilizing the apps that they create as well. So, yeah. and United is also a client of mine. So, and United is hubbed here in Denver. So I also fly them all the time. I'm on their app all the time. Um, but I don't have any other really great apps that I use to help keep me organized. So no, that's probably the the reality is it's what you use, not what you think you should use. Right, exactly. Well, and luckily, I, my I have a pretty I, I I I keep a lot of good information up here. I'm I'm able to know like what are my responsibilities. I do keep notes for myself in my phone, just the notes app, which is you know, I do that quite a bit, and uh, I also have. Um, I have a, a great admin that helps keep me on on task as well. So I, I can delegate some of those tasks to people who um, have greater gifts in those areas than what I do as well. That's great. Hey, Michelle, let's wrap things up here. I want to say thank you for joining me today. Uh, I look, I definitely want to pursue another conversation about your book, your first venture into fiction, The Real Sisters. That Absolutely. that I, I know that there's a great story behind that, and I want to follow up that a little bit more. I'd also like to go deeper into some more specific facilitation skills. So okay. I, I hope to have another conversation with you soon. Absolutely. Anytime.